just imagine if you had a money printing machine, like what would you do with it, right? You would probably hit print on that machine repeatedly until that machine was blowing sparks and smoke and didn't work anymore, right? You would run it into the ground. And indeed, that's what central banks have done to every currency that has ever been monopolized throughout human history. They depreciate the currency to enrich the politically favored few and dump the costs on society. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the What Is Money show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the collection of money. Now, if this is your first time listening to the What Is Money show, I strongly recommend that you go back to episodes one through nine first, which lays a lot of the groundwork for many of the concepts that we explore on the show. These first nine episodes are my series with Michael Saylor and thousands of people have told me that this is the best podcast series they've ever heard, hands down, and that it was instrumental to their understanding of money and Bitcoin. So if you're looking to start a deep dive into the nature of money, I don't think there's any place better that you can start other than episode one of this show. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. The What Is Money show is 100% sponsor based. So all of our revenues are derived from direct sponsorships. And I strive to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically only using sponsors that I use personally, and also choosing sponsors that have values which are well aligned to the values expressed on this show, such as freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm going to do now is a few ad reads right at the top of the show, and then I'll do a few more ad reads in the middle. And I hope you'll take the time to listen to them, as again, these are hand-selected sponsors, and I think you'll like what they have to offer. Today's podcast is brought to you by In Wolf's Clothing. Wolf is the first startup accelerator dedicated exclusively to the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Four times per year, Wolf brings teams from around the world to New York City to work with like-minded entrepreneurs, pushing the boundaries of what's possible with Bitcoin and Lightning. The program is designed to help early-stage companies achieve product market fit, develop their brand, secure early-stage funding, and grow businesses that help fuel the global adoption of Bitcoin. So go to wolfnyc.com to learn more about the program or apply. Again, that's WolfNYC, W-O-L-F-N-Y-C dot com. Welcome. We've got a uh, pretty excited uh, Robert Breedlove uh, is with us today. So, Robert, thanks for being here. You you're in Tennessee, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Yeah. Uh, thanks for having me, Sean. I'm a Tennessee native, but I'm not currently in Tennessee. Uh, okay. But I do live there, yes. I think, I'm not I'm not 100% certain, but I was at Bitcoin Park in Nashville. I think you were recording a podcast, maybe, and they said, yeah, he's in behind the door there. Uh, so I was, I've been in your proximity, like within 10 feet away, but I think you were inside, this, inside a room. So yeah, I guess we'll just get into that. You are obviously a, a figure in the Bitcoin ecosystem, a pretty prominent figure in that. And I think you, you say entrepreneurialism, philosophy, stuff like that. Maybe you just share a little bit of your background with us and so we can get an idea where you come from. Yeah, I'll give you a kind of the quick version. I am, so I grew up in Tennessee, went to college in Tennessee. I have a background in accounting and finance. And um, I guess my initial like foray, sorry, there's music in the background. Is that too loud? I, I can't hear it. You can't hear it, okay. My initial foray into the subject of money was the book, The Creature from Jekyll Island which is on the nature and history of central banking written by G. Edward Griffin. And so that, I think I read that book in about 2004, 2005. So that's what initially got me interested in the topic. But, and basically the central thrust of that book is that central banking is the largest organized crime syndicate in the history of the world. But at the time of the time I read the book, there was no viable solution to central banking. So I had come to this sort of bleak realization that we had a very big problem in the world called the central bank, yet we had nothing to do about it. And so I just put that in a box for myself intellectually and moved on with my life and went on to get my master's degree in accounting and finance. I was in public accounting for a while. Then I was a, a CFO, mostly focused in technology sector. And then 
I heard about Bitcoin in 2014, but didn't start to pay attention until 2016, 2017. And upon reading the book by Safety and Amuse, the Bitcoin Standard, that was my light bulb moment or my orange pill moment, as we call it in Bitcoin circles, that Bitcoin is the solution to central banking. We've had this historical problem where people in different times and different places, almost every civilization, political power has always attempted to monopolize currency production. And they basically use that physical power to steal from people systematically. When ancient Rome, this was coin clipping, right? So they would melt down the coins, take out some of the fine metal content and reissue the coins in a diluted way. So the political class would enrich itself at the expense of citizens. And today we do it with fancy terms like quantitative easing or, or money printing, where we just actually increase the number of dollars in a database. And that enriches the shareholders of the central bank and those politically favored few that are proximate to the money printer. And it dumps the cost on society and citizens. And indeed, if you need evidence of this, you could just look at the trillions we've printed since COVID in early 2020 and how much the price of, I know your favorite commodity, <laughs> beef has what, doubled, if not more in those three years? So the, it's a bleak realization that the world's run by currency counterfeiting monopolies or currency counterfeiting cartels, to use a more precise term, but it is the world we live in. And so I've made it my mission in my life's work to try and broadcast this message to as many people as possible and hopefully help put a dent in the universe that helps us get over this um, governance by organized crime. Yeah, you mentioned safety. I, I met safe in, I think, 2017. And initially, we were going to write a carnivore book together. And then he ended up writing Bitcoin Standard, which obviously has been a, a very uh, well received book in, in those circles. And so it's weird you have this sort of weird crossover between a carnivore community and a Bitcoin community. Not everybody does, but there's, I think, some co commonalities in, in saying, hey, there's something wrong with the system. And obviously, the dietary fiat is, 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 People are calling it and same thing with the money fiat system. It's like something ain't right, something doesn't smell right. Let's look at something differently. Now you said there's a, there's finally a solution to this problem. Well, I guess let's maybe further elucidate the problem there. Jekyll Island off the coast, I believe, Georgia. I think it's in Georgia, right? right? Yeah, for Georgia is where they had a big some I know I, I briefly know what you're talking about. There was a big meeting back in the early nineteen hundreds, I think, and they got together and this is where this genesis of this, I guess, cartel as you call it maybe began. So how, how do, when you say they, they control a lot of things or controllable, what are some of the examples of what's going on for people that are blissfully unaware of this stuff? Yeah. So for people that haven't read that book, I would highly encourage you to do so. It's actually available as an audio book for free on YouTube. So you can listen to the entire audio book, The Creature from Jekyll Island. It's pretty lengthy. I think there's an abridged version that is probably in the, the ballpark of six to eight hours, but the, the whole book is tens of hours. I'm not sure, 20 or 30 hours probably. And essentially what happened in Jekyll Island was a secret meeting among the financial elite of the time. And they were putting together a plan to install a central bank into the United States. And this was something the United States had resisted twice before. We had learned a lot when we left when in revolting against England, but there's a strong argument to be made that a lot of that was due to escape the tyranny of the central bank, the Bank of England. And so the founding fathers of the United States knew of the evils of currency monopolization and central banking and tried to build into the Constitution mechanisms that resisted that. And indeed, those mechanisms worked twice, but this third attempt was snuck in the back door. And you've got to read the book to really, if you really want to get into the nature of money and the nature of central banking, I can't do the book justice in just a couple of minutes here, but to, to try and summarize it, or at least summarize the impact of it, money is the most important asset in the world. I mean, intuitively, I think most people would understand that, right? Money is redeemable for any good or service, anything that anyone's labor can produce. You could consider it like a non-legal claim on human time or human energy. 
And so if you empower one organization with the power to produce new units of money, add in item, right? They can produce as many as they want and they can, they prevent other people from being able to produce currency, right? This is a legal monopoly. So I always like to say that the guns are pointed outward. If you or I try to start a business that competes with the US dollar, we go to jail. But for central bank shareholders, this is just another business as usual. Another way to say this is obviously counterfeiting money is illegal. What George Floyd, right? He had a $20 counterfeit bill, I think was the beginning of one of his crimes and it led to that whole protest and whatnot. That $20 counterfeit bill is the same things that the Federal Reserve does by the trillion, right? So there's no economic difference between currency counterfeiting and inflation, basically. And a very popular phrase I've used to try to crystallize this is that inflation is legal. Counterfeiting is criminal inflation. There's absolutely no economic distinction between these two phenomena. There is only a legal distinction. There, there's a, it's a two-tier economic system, right? This is not democracy. This is not we are all equal in the eyes of the law. This is in-group, out-group. So it's a very deeply rooted problem in the socioeconomic fabric of the human race. And it's not, again, the Federal Reserve is the current central bank for the current global superpower, which is the United States. But before that, we had the Bank of England. Before that, we had the Bank of Antwerp. I'm actually in Antwerp now. The central banking, central banking crime has been occurring for a long time. There's a great book on this, actually. Very short read called Layered Money by Nick Batia. My friend in Los Angeles wrote this. And he has a short 10-chapter book. You can read it in a few hours that goes through the entire history of central banking. And it just shows how any place and any time where humans gained the capacity or, or arrogated themselves the privilege to monopolize and counterfeit the currency, they have done so because it is an instrument of effectively absolute power. And again, if you want to lean on your intuition about this, just imagine if you had a money printing machine, like what would you do with it, right? You would probably hit print on that machine repeatedly until that machine was blowing sparks and smoke and didn't work anymore, right? You would run it into the ground. And indeed, that's what central banks have done to every currency that has ever been monopolized throughout human history. They depreciate the currency to enrich the politically favored few and dump the costs on society. And the consequences are difficult to understate, right? If you look at a country going through a hyperinflation, it's equivalent to a mass psychosis. You can't buy bread. You can't make, make ends meet. You can't buy the basic necessities of life. You can't buy beef. Forget bread. You can't buy beef. You can't trust people outside of just your inner circle. And so the entire trust fabric that holds civilization together collapses along with the currency. So this is the real like root problem, I think, with many socioeconomic problems in the world. And again, to safety, he wrote the Bitcoin standard. Then after he wrote the fiat standard and the fiat standard goes through all of those consequences in detail, right? It affects food. It affects health care. It affects people's incentives to be honest, right? There's a strong case to be made that inflation or counterfeiting of currency is something like a moral cancer on the world. And so this is, it's a very deep, almost spiritual sickness that we are suffering from. And historically, gold has been the answer, but gold is not practical enough. It's not practical to carry around blocks of gold in your pocket. You can't use it for day-to-day -day transactions. It's uh, risky and expensive to secure, difficult to ship, et cetera, et cetera. So we've always had to centralize the custody of gold and issue paper receipts on top of it. But when you centralize that much power in one place, as Lord Acton said, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. When you put all that money in one place, that absolute power, that institution that grows up around it is the most corrupt institution in the world. And that is the central bank. So this is uh, this gets into the argument for Bitcoin. We need a form of money that exhibits the economic properties of gold 
but does not lend itself to centralization. Because if you have something that is physical and gets centralized, then you end up with a central bank and you end up with a currency counterfeiting monopoly. But if you have something that's non-physical, people can custody it themselves, right? We don't need to trust the bank to hold our money. We can hold our own money. And so this is the, I guess, the little window into the gigantic revolution that is Bitcoin. I think was it Nixon finally decoupled us off of the gold standard back in 71. And I think we were only even partially attached to that, but is there any thought? Cause I know there's the sort of the, what is it? The guys that are big gold, gold advocates. <clears throat> is there no reason we can go back to that? We've got too much money. We don't have enough gold to represent all the monies out there unless we devalued the money back to what gold we physically own. Is that something that is, were we better off even before 1971? I, I can't remember when we, we fully went off the gold standard, but I think that was 71. And before that we did that, were, was it, functioning as it should have been back when we were fully tied to gold? There's not a discrete time that we were like on gold standard than off gold standard. What tends to happen is you have all this gold centralized into one bank, which was what was originally called a money warehouse. So you put your gold on deposit with a warehouse. The warehouse operator issues you a warehouse receipt. And this is just an IOU for gold, right? So now I have this paper certificate that says it's good for so many ounces of gold. And this makes gold much more convenient to use as a transactional medium because you can transact and carry paper much more easily than you can physical gold. The problem this introduces, though, is that you now have to trust that warehouse operator, which would become a bank and later become a central bank, to not issue more IOUs to the gold than they had gold in reserve, right? This is what is called fractional reserve banking. So a business that starts to issue more liabilities, which are the IOUs for gold, then it has assets to make good on, which is the gold itself. And so the 1971 Nixon shock you're referring to, to give a little bit of background on that, during World War II, Hitler's storming through Europe, Every time he conquers a country, the first place he goes is to that country's central bank. And he raids their gold hoard, like whatever gold they have on hand. That's the first and most valuable thing he needs to seize to fund the blitzkrieg, to fund the war effort. Right? War is the most catastrophic and expensive activity human beings can engage in. If you can't if there's no carrot at the end of that stick, right? If there's not an incentive to do it, not, not a way to pay for it when you conquer your enemies, then you're not, going to, you're not going to engage in it. So as Hitler's making his way across Europe, seizing countries' gold, a lot of these countries start to see that, hey, this is a real threat. If Hitler keeps coming west, he's going to seize our gold, so on and so forth. So the Allies start to ship a lot of their gold into North America as like a geographic safe haven from the, the potential threat of Nazi plundering. And so a lot of gold ends up in the U.S. And then eventually U.S. enters World War II late. Our, our, the opponents are war, war wearied by this point. I think we had 30 million Russians dead. Germany had taken significant losses. The allies in Europe had taken significant losses. But all the gold, or not all, but most of the gold had flowed into North America. So all of a sudden, North America and the United States are in a very advantaged position to come into this war, well-funded, fresh, bring in fresh troops and armaments, and put an end to the war. And indeed, that's what we did, right? We declared ourselves the victors of World War II. And what is the first thing that we do at the conclusion of World War II? We hold what is called the Bretton Woods Conference, where we rewrite the global banking rules. And we say, all right, now the U.S. dollar will be pegged to gold and all other international currencies will be pegged to the dollar. And so this gave the United States what the French would later call the exorbitant privilege or the deficit, the ability to run the deficit without tears. So we could just print new units of dollars, ship them abroad. Other countries would send us goods and services, and we basically end up being the central bank for the world. Now, this works to some extent so long as those dollars are redeemable for gold. 
But what the United States starts to do is to run a fractional reserve. And so by 1971, I think the total number of U.S. dollar liabilities outstanding were about six times more than its gold reserves. Countries started asking for gold to be repatriated, like France and like England. And it was when Germany asked to repatriate some of their gold, to swap some of these dollars they had accumulated by sending the U.S. goods and services. They wanted to send the dollars back for gold. That is what invoked the 1971 Nixon shock. When he came on unexpectedly, blamed international trade flows and greedy capitalists like statists always tend to blame. And he said, hey, guys, we need to go off of the gold standard temporarily to deal with these economic hiccups. And we'll go back once the government fixes everything. That was 1971. We're in the year 2023. So that's 52 years ago that we went on to this temporary, quote unquote, temporary fiat standard where the United States could just produce dollars that were not redeemable for gold and export them to the world, export inflation to the world and import those goods and services. So this put the United States in an even more advantaged position. So my argument, and Bitcoiners have this argument a lot with gold bugs, is that gold has already failed as money. You can't have a physical commodity money that lends itself to centralization because the institutions that grow up or grow up around that much centralized power inevitably become corrupt. You just can't trust humans not to print money, basically, or, or to run fractional reserve banks, to say, say it more specifically. And so what you have is this spectrum, right? Like a full reserve bank would be one in which every warehouse or sheet or dollar outstanding had a commensurate gold, piece of gold on deposit in the bank. So assets matched liabilities, right? That's a full reserve bank. When you start running a fractional reserve, right? Like the United States, like I said, it was six to one by 1971. So they have 16% of the gold necessary to meet their outstanding liabilities. Well, that's a problem, right? The US doesn't want to send the gold away. Gold is money, right? It's geopolitical money in this sense. So what do they do? We have the Nixon shock and we move on to a zero reserve standard, the fiat standard. This is where gold, money currency specifically is no longer redeemable for money, which is gold. So I don't think we can just go back to a gold standard because gold has already failed time and time again. You can't put that much physical money in one place and not expect the political institutions that grow up around it to not be corrupt. We're no longer tied to gold. So what is, what is, because the dollar, you know, there's a, this BRICS thing coming on with Russia and Brazil and so on and so forth, but the U.S. dollar, even after 71, was still tied to something. The, the, the goodwill of the United States, the strength of the United States, the economy, the productivity of the United States, the GDP of the United States, or something that they were trying to make it justifying the value of a dollar. It was, it was not just. Yeah. So to talk about what backs money. This is a very common critique of Bitcoin, actually. People like to say, oh, Bitcoin, it's intangible. It's not backed by anything, right? There's no issuing authority. There's no government behind it. There's no central bank behind it. I think to answer that question properly, you have to look at what gold is, right? Like, why did gold become money in the first place? And again, Safety's book is great on this. He talks about the stock to flow ratio of commodities. So basically, the asset which exhibits the most hardness, which is another way of saying inflation resistance, which is another way of saying counterfeit resistance. It's most the commodity which has a supply that is most difficult to increase, which means if I'm saving in gold or I'm whatever asset I'm saving in, I want to be able to trust that. No one else can dilute me by printing more of it or producing more of it. Gold was that commodity, right? Historically, gold is indestructible. So basically, every ounce of gold that's ever been mined in human history is still part of the existing supply today. People say it fits in two Olympic-sized swimming pools, all the gold in the world. And its supply over centuries has reliably increased at about 2% per year. 
So this was the most inflation resistant commodity that, that could serve as money. That's why it was selected on the free market as money, right? This is the best place to store purchasing power across time in a way that people cannot arbitrarily inflate the supply of it and therefore dilute and steal your stored purchasing power. So it's the, and what's backing gold in that instance is energy, right? It takes energy. It takes human time, effort, and energy to produce gold. There's a cost to increase the supply of gold. This is what secured it against arbitrary inflation or arbitrary counterfeiting. Now, the U.S. dollar post Bretton Woods was pegged to gold, right? But as we just described, the United States started to overissue dollars relative to gold reserves, and you ended up running a fractional reserve. And eventually, post-1971, we go on to the fiat standard, where the dollar is no longer redeemable for gold. So in that move, you have now switched from a money that requires time, effort, and energy to produce to a currency, a fiat currency, that requires zero time, effort, or energy to produce. It's just an entry in a database. You're just adding zeros, right? It, Today, the U.S. dollar today is an SQL database maintained on premise at the Federal Reserve that they can just add zeros to at will, right? They can and arbitrarily dole out those proceeds and dump the cost, the inflationary cost, onto those who can't access the money. And, so, and for more on this, you could look, and which basically says those who receive the newly printed money first are stealing from those who receive the newly printed money later, right? So you as a political insider get the fresh trillion dollars printed. You can go and buy assets at their current market value before that new infusion of currency increases those asset prices. And now the guy that gets it last is living paycheck to paycheck. The guy that's buying beef, right? His price of beef has doubled. His living costs have now doubled. So it's an implicit and insidious form of taxation. And it's one that people don't readily understand because this it gives the government a lot of plausible deniability. When prices go up, we've heard this over the past three years, prices have increased a lot, right? We mentioned beef doubling. If you go into mainstream media, you'll hear terms like the Putin inflation or supply chain issues causing the inflation. They even blame Beyonce and like concerts and like certain events causing the price inflation. You'll never hear them mention the six trillion dollars that the U.S. printed in the past three years. Like, how are you ignoring that elephant in the room? It just it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And so, to take it back to what's backing the dollar today, it's really just this confidence game. You're betting that the United States will continue to be dominant militarily. You're betting that the United States will continue to be an, an effective and imposing tax authority. So we'll be able to steal property and labor from their citizens through taxation, through inflation. And you'll, you're betting that this confidence game will continue going. Now, many people don't cognitively understand this. Of course, they're just caught up in the mix. But this is the nature of the game. And to try to make it intuitive, every given third of the world requires human time, effort, and energy to produce, right? Nothing comes free, right? There's no free lunch, as is often said. If money is that instrument that we use to exchange for goods and services, doesn't it only seem just and fair that the money must also require time, effort, and energy to produce if it lays claim to goods and services which require time, effort, and energy to produce? And if the money does not require time, effort, nor energy to produce, then whoever can produce it without cost can use it to steal from those who cannot. And this is the game. This is the big rigged pyramid scheme, fiat currency, central banking fiasco. And this is what's tearing the world apart. This is what funds mainstream media. This is what funds psyops. This is why central government has become so overgrown since 1971. There's a great website on this topic. 
WTF happened in 1971.com. And it goes through an entire series of data of all of these things that have come off the rails since 1971. Divorces are up. Obesity is up. Suicide rates are up. Addiction rates are up. Wages and productivity have diverged, right? So there's no longer enough to just be better and better at your business to get rich. You have to actually outrun the inflation that's being foisted upon you. And so, again, it's difficult to overstate how devastating this is. When you, in, in Bitcoin circles, we have this mantra fix the money, fix the world, right? Give people the, a sound working money. Let entrepreneurs do what entrepreneurs do, which is solve problems for other humans. Make sure that your input costs are less than your outputs. Turn a profit, increase human productivity, further human civilization, create human flourishing. Fiat currency is the unwind of that entire process. It is undermining the entrepreneurial spirit itself and undermining civilization in the process. So it, it, it sounds radical for those that are uninitiated. But I really encourage people to just study the nature of money, study Bitcoin. And this is why I named my podcast, The What Is Money Show. Ask yourself that question. What is money? And the veils of bullshit will gradually be lifted. If you are a business owner or manager, you should know these three numbers. 36,000, 25, and 1. 36,000 is the number of businesses that have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, which allows you to streamline accounting, financial management, human resources, and more. NetSuite turns 25 years old this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days rather than weeks, and to drive down cost. And finally, one, because your business is one of a kind. So with NetSuite, you get a customized solution for all your key performance indicators in one efficient system with one source of truth. NetSuite is everything you need all in one place. Right now, you can download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash whatismoney. That's netsuite.com slash whatismoney to get your free KPI checklist. Again, netsuite.com slash whatismoney. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, iCoin Technology iCoin has just released a sleek new hardware wallet. Looks like a mini iPhone, a little touch screen and camera on it. Uh, the device has no Wi-Fi, no cellular connection, no GPS. It's a strictly physically cold hardware wallet. Uh, like I said, it's got a high-res 3-inch touch screen. It's got a camera for air gapping the wallet. Uh, it's got optional Bluetooth compatibility. And it's a really a, a brand new UI, UX experience for a hardware wallet, making it very accessible, easy to use, not intimidating. And as we always talk about on this show, the only way you can truly own your Bitcoin is by having it in self-custody. So you need a device like iCoin Wallet to truly own your Bitcoin. Go to iCoinTechnology.com today and use promo code BITCOIN23 for 30% off of this new sleek hardware wallet. Obviously, Bitcoin right, looks at the market caps, 550 billion or so right now. I think it's been as high as a trillion. How many do we know how many people are into Bitcoin right now? If, we, if, we, if Bitcoin was its own country, would it be 100 million people, 200 million people? Do we know the, the, the approximate size of that right now? Yeah, so difficult to estimate, but the estimates that I've gathered from multiple people put that number the Bitcoin number of Bitcoin holders in the world, somewhere around 70 to 100 million people. Although I don't think that's actually the very important number. It is an important number. It's that's 100 million out of 8 billion. Not bad. Good start for the first 14 years of Bitcoin's history. But what really matters is what percentage of monetary capital is being preserved in Bitcoin. In, in economics, we call this cash balances. So what percentage of cash balances are being held in Bitcoin versus gold versus bonds, etc.? And today, that number is around 0.5%. That's Bitcoin's got a lot of upside. If it is the most superior monetary technology that's ever existed, and we can get into the reasons why it is, if you like, then the 
theory is that as people continue to experience or suffer from more inflation, more taxation, more regulation, more government oppression, right? They're having this theft pushed on them that people start to figure out, hey, if I really want to preserve my purchasing power in a way that's independent and resistant to, fully resistant to this theft being imposed upon me by the state, then I'm going to need to start putting a few of my eggs in this basket over here called Bitcoin. And so that is the monetization process. It's like the more theft that's occurring, people are naturally migrating to the asset that is most resistant to theft via inflation or taxation. And so today that's about 0.5% of the total cash balances in the world. And Bitcoiners believe that we're going to move into a world where Bitcoin is the vast majority of cash balances held. And that is, this is why the Bitcoin price goes up, by the way. it's There's 21 million fixed supply. There's unknown supplies of fiat currencies. They're increasing. They're always increasing. They're often increasing at an accelerating rate. So they exponentially increase, especially in times of like COVID, where we just suddenly print $6 trillion in the US. I think it was $30 trillion total. That that value comes from somewhere. It's being stolen from people when that currency is being counterfeited and people are figuring out, I need to exit this system and protect myself in the system over here where I can't be victimized by the fiat currency complex. So betting on Bitcoin is just betting on that, that people are going to act in their own self-interest. Central banks are going to keep printing money. Government's going to keep misallocating capital and stealing from people. And that individuals over time will wake up to this scam and put their purchasing power, their economic energy in the asset that is most pristine and resistant to all of those shenanigans. Let me ask you, you mentioned, I think you called it the Cantillon effect, where early adopters, early people that have access to the money will then inflate it so that everybody else pays the consequence. That how does, let's say we got like guys like Michael Saylor, who's got a huge Bitcoin, but I don't know who has the most Bitcoin in the world, but I'm, he's certainly up there. How do we prevent those guys from saying, hey, we got all this stuff, we have all the power, we have all the money, and then you guys late adopters. How do we prevent the same thing from happening within Bitcoin, the, that so-called Cantillon effect? Yeah, it's a good question. So there is this, the problem with inflation and currency counterfeiting, it wouldn't matter if it was perfectly symmetrical, right? So if we, everyone in the world today that holds a dollar, if they all of a sudden were issued an extra dollar, right? So everyone's dollar supply in their bank account doubled. That would actually have no effect because that there's no redistribution occurring. It's like a stock split, if you're familiar with that concept. Sometimes a company will have 100,000 shares of equity and they'll just do a split to 200,000. That doesn't shift any wealth around on the cap table. Like it's not some shareholders stealing from other shareholders because it's perfectly equal. It's non-redistributive. The problem with inflation is that there are a few people printing the new shares, if you will, and others that are not. So those that print the new shares get to steal from those who do not print the new shares, in this case, currency. So th that is the Cantillon effect, this redistributive effect on wealth through the centralized inflation or counterfeiting of currency. Now with Bitcoin, it's impossible to counterfeit. No one can increase the supply of it. No one can change the supply beyond 21 million. So therefore, there is no way to initiate the Cantillon effect. I can't, you can't, no one can print Bitcoin to enrich themselves and dump the inflationary cost on others. So we're all forced to play by this common rule set. And the rule set is universal. It's immutable. It's unchangeable. You could think of it as like the first level playing field in the domain of money that humans have ever had. Gold would have been a proxy for it, but again, gold has all the problems we mentioned earlier with centralization and whatnot. Bitcoin is, and this is why it's such a magnificent innovation, hard to understand. It's like taking the economic properties of gold that made it really good money and then infusing them with all of the economic properties of the internet that makes the internet useful, right? That we can move information without permission around the globe. We can do Zoom calls without asking permission. We, it, it, in the same way the internet has unlocked the free flow of information, Bitcoin unlocks the free flow of economic value that can't be monopolized or stolen. 
And that's, I think it's a useful analogy that Bitcoin basically is the internet. If you really consider what the internet is, it's a stack of these open source protocols, many of which we've heard of, SMTP, right? The simple transfer mail protocol. This is what runs email. HTTP, the hypertext transfer protocol. This is what enables uh, websites to work. There's a stack of these open source protocols that allow us to move information around the world uh, in a non-centralized way, right? We're not going through a centralized broadcasting system. We're going through, we're going peer to peer, right? We're doing it right now. Bitcoin is just the latest layer on that stack of the internet protocol suite. And it's an internet protocol for moving economic value or purchasing power around in the same permissionless way that the internet lets us move information around. So it's, I think it's probably the best analogy. Like when people talk about Bitcoin, not Bitcoin, it's okay, is the internet useful? Is money useful? Then Bitcoin is very useful because it is combined the best properties of the best money with the best properties of the internet to become this one hybrid innovation. How do we, 20 million Bitcoins are already in existence of a total of 21, so basically 95% of it, of all Bitcoin has already been created. It's only another roughly 5% more. And that's already owned by people. People are hodling it, so to speak. They're holding it. If the world is to go onto a Bitcoin standard, that has to change. You can't have 100 million people having everything and then the other 8 billion people having no access to it. So how do you get people to unhodl or how do you get it into circulation? I know like places like in South America, El Salvador has now adopted as part of their legal tender. But how, how do you go from 100 million to 5 billion people? How's that going to happen? Yeah, again, the adoption, I think, uh, this is a, a phrase I use a lot on the show, is that pain is information. Right. People learn through pain. The body learns through pain. Right. When we go and work out, you're basically forcing yourself into these painful movements to forcibly adapt yourself to be able to lift heavier weights or run faster or whatever it may be. And I think the adoption of Bitcoin occurs through pain, actually. Again, it's people that are suffering. So Venezuela, right? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So go to Venezuela that are just trying to survive, right? They just want to eat tomorrow or next week or pay rent. They need to have a store of value that is independent of the inflationary Venezuelan currency. So that's one end of the spectrum, right? This poor people trying to just get by or escape government oppression or theft. But at the other end of the spectrum, you also have billionaires, right? People that hold a tremendous amount of wealth When things get really bad and governments start to turn toward that toxic ideology of socialism, let's tax the rich and give it to the poor. The rich also want to preserve their purchasing power. They don't want to be looted and have it distributed to the masses. So what do they do? They need to also adopt this asset that's protected from theft. So you have Bitcoin adoption occurring at two two poles, the poor trying to survive and the, the rich trying to escape wealth redistribution. I think that's what pushes it into more and more hands. To answer your question more specifically, though, what gets people to spend Bitcoin, right? Everyone's holding Bitcoin now. What gets people to spend? If you bought Bitcoin at a dollar and Bitcoin's at $30,000 today, that's a pretty large incentive for you to spend some Bitcoin, right? You have a multi 10,000, 100,000 percent unrealized gain in your Bitcoin position. Right. I bought Bitcoin, a thousand Bitcoin at a dollar. I now have a thousand Bitcoin valued at thirty thousand dollars. So that's what, thirty million dollars, if I'm doing my math correctly. That's a big incentive, right? Your basis is a thousand. Your fair market value is 30 million. (laughs) I think you have an incentive to go and spend some of that, right? You want to buy other things. You want to buy a house. You want to eat, whatever, take trips. People always want to consume. That's the nature of economics, right? We want bigger houses, more trips, more travel, more experience, better food, bigger family, et cetera, et cetera. So those who adopt Bitcoin earlier have a larger incentive to spend Bitcoin as it appreciates. Those that adopt it later have a smaller incentive to do. They have more of an incentive to save it and to hold it. So this is how this is. Have you ever heard of an Indian run? You ever done one of these in a workout class? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're a line of people run, and the guy in the back has to run 
past the whole line to get to the front. And then the guy in the back has to run past the whole line and get to the front. It's that same type of circular dynamic that sort of drives the distribution of Bitcoin into more and more hands as people figure things out or as people experience a certain level of economic pain and they get into Bitcoin at whatever position, whatever price, right? And once you're in at a certain basis, that determines your incentive to spend it or save it. If you're underwater, if you bought Bitcoin at $69,000 and it's 30,000 today, well, you have very little incentive to spend it. That would be a realized loss. But if Bitcoin goes to $500,000, you have a large imputed gain into your position, which would be an, be an incentive to spend. So it's this sort of a cyclical rotational dynamic that drives the dispersion of Bitcoin into more and more people's hands. What what does it have to get to? Because like you said, you've got a lot of people that are underwater on Bitcoin that, that maybe bought in at 50 grand or whatever it is, and now it's down a little bit. And there's a certain percentage that went over that. But if it's to be redistributed and for everybody to use, and you guys got like Michael Saylor saying, hey, hodl it and, and borrow against it, just use it as an asset that you can borrow against like all the other wealthy people often do. So what number do you think it has to get to? And it's been... Over the last year or so, it's been fairly non-labile. It's been 25, 28, 20, and it's been staying there for a while. What's going to drive it up to whatever it needs to reach, a million dollars or whatever's going to get there? How's that going to happen? Again, the, the U.S. dollar price of Bitcoin, I think, is driven by what we just discussed, right? It's the pain. It's how many people need this tool to serve their individual self-interest. Again, whether you are victim of hyperinflation or you are the billionaire attempting to escape wealth redistribution schemes by your federal government. The, the dollar price, though, again, we're increasing the supply of dollars all the time. So the number go up technology is you're going to have more and more dollars chasing the same fixed quantity of Bitcoin over time. And that's why the U.S. dollar price goes up. Now, Bitcoin is an asset. You can borrow against it. Not something that I recommend, actually. And I think what Michael Saylor is doing is a brilliant strategy. He's really borrowing against the equity in his business, right? He has a cash flow positive business. He's able to go into global capital markets, tap that for cheap debt. He then sells those dollars and buys Bitcoin for his treasury. So he's like dumping fiat and hoarding Bitcoin effectively. But his business is producing more and more fiat every quarter. So that's why he's buying more and more Bitcoin every quarter. Now, the Bitcoin on his balance sheet, an interesting play, it adds a lot of value to the business, right? Adds a lot of enterprise value. It also adds volatility to the stock price. So this creates more demand for uh, people that like to play in arbitrage markets and whatnot. They want stocks that are volatile so they can trade them and, and uh, basically try to day trade them, play games and, and whatnot to, to generate profits. So... The spirit of that, though, or the lesson for the common person is just stay profitable, right? Produce more than you spend, earn more than you spend, stack sats, which is saying buy Bitcoin, accumulate Bitcoin over time as a long-term savings vehicle. And just you're betting on, again, that more dollars will be printed, more people will figure this out. And that then the U.S. dollar price of your Bitcoin savings, therefore, will continue to go up in dollar terms. But to try to put a specific dollar amount to it, I can't. Who's to say, right? Who knows what number it needs to hit for people to wake up? Again, Bitcoin's 14 years old. We're at 70 to 100 million people that hold it today. These cycles have repeated over and over. Bitcoin tends to do these massive meteoric price spikes. And then it will collapse 85 plus percent. And then it will go level for a long time. And then it'll have another giant run up. There's a lot of theory about what drives those price cycles. Every four years, the Bitcoin algorithm reduces the new supply issuance of Bitcoin by 50%. So Bitcoin is becoming harder and harder to produce every four years. And this is the opposite of what the US dollar and fiat currencies are doing. They're increasing their rate of production over time. More and more dollars and other fiat currencies are produced. So this interplay between fiat currencies and Bitcoin seems to be driving these price cycles. Though when Bitcoin has a halving, the miners that are producing Bitcoin start to sell less onto the market. And therefore, less selling for Bitcoin drives up 
the price of Bitcoin, but it goes, it's very volatile, right? It goes way up. We went from a thousand to 20,000 in 2017. And then the price drew down to, I think, 4,000 in 2018. So it's very volatile in US dollar terms because it's very small, right? You can think of this as like a small boat on a big wavy ocean. But as Bitcoin grows and it has more market capitalization, and this is true for any asset, the volatility tends to come down. And indeed, that's what we've seen over time is that Bitcoin's price volatility has declined as its market capitalization has grown. Yeah, let's say it gets to $50 trillion market cap or some some big increase, 100x or something like that. Then we're getting less volatility. It's just going gonna, gonna to stay there for longer, most likely, and perhaps... Let me ask you, Signal, because it's 14 years, you, everybody's, every two years, somebody's predicting the death of Bitcoin, and yet it's here it is. It's still going. It's still going. All these cryptocurrencies have come and gone. Uh, Bitcoin is now, it look, looks at like they're 42% of the entire crypto market. So they're, they're, they're definitely the elephant in the room. Uh, and I know people don't like to associate Bitcoin necessarily with crypto. Uh, it's because of the, I guess, the philosophical way it's, of nature of it. But what what sort of signals are we seeing? I saw BlackRock maybe taking a position on Bitcoin, which is maybe some people are worried about that. Do we, do we want BlackRock having a dominant Bitcoin position? What are you seeing happening with the SEC, with other central banks, with things that, that indicate to you widespread adoption of Bitcoin is imminent? Or is there anything? Yeah, to speak to crypto first, and this is why Bitcoiners don't like the term crypto, because there's this preconceived notion, perhaps, that Bitcoin is one of thousands of crypto assets. And if you import conventional wisdom from Wall Street into crypto, you think, oh, I'll just diversify and hold an index of all these things and whichever one wins. And I'll just, so long as the asset class appreciates, I don't need to pick the winner. I just benefit from whichever one wins. But that conventional wisdom doesn't work in the realm of money. That'd be like trying to buy, you'd be like going into the monetary metals market and saying, I'm just going to buy every metal and we'll just see which one wins as money. When in fact, it's like, well, obviously all of the monetary premium collapse into gold, right? Because Money is this single purpose tool, right? We want something that has a very wide network, that it's saleable, that has the most people that accept it. It's the most universally accepted medium of exchange. So there's a network effect associated with money that it tends toward one, like a winner take all. And that's indeed what we saw with gold, analog gold. And I think that is also what we see with digital gold, right? Bitcoin has already become this uh, de facto winner, right? By virtue of it being first mover, by virtue of its the attacks on Bitcoin that it's resisted, its rules haven't changed. All of these other crypto assets, most of them are scams for starters, like 95% of them. The ones that are actually trying to compete with Bitcoin just can't because there's not, there's no attack surface left, right? Bitcoin has already perfected money as it is. And if a crypto asset is able to introduce some superior feature that Bitcoin doesn't have, Bitcoin still retains this open source code capacity to absorb new features. So just hypothetically, if, I don't know, there's some new property of money that none of us have figured out that's really important, Bitcoin can be upgraded to feature that. So it makes competing with Bitcoin as money seemingly impossible. And to speak to... BlackRock, these are just, this is the normal path of monetization, right? It's when I started in Bitcoin six, seven years ago, we were laughed at, right? We're laughed at, like nation states are going to adopt Bitcoin. Wall Street guys laugh you out of the room, right? No way, never going to happen. Not government backed. There's no central authority about it. There's no chance. But the reality of the world is that we're all... It's a big constellation of individuals, right? We often think in terms of aggregates. What is China going to do? What is the United States going to do? What is BlackRock going to do? But beneath the surface of that aggregate, which we need to use to simplify our thinking, are a bunch of individuals. And what are those individuals doing? They're competing, right? They're trying to maximize their profit. They're trying to maximize their financial position. And so Bitcoin best serves the, the purposes of individuals inside all organizations, whether it's the nation state, whether it's BlackRock, whatever. And that there's also this fear 
that BlackRock will somehow corrupt Bitcoin or take control of Bitcoin or change it. And that just betrays a very deep ignorance of Bitcoin, right? The, the magic of Bitcoin, the, power, the real power of it, is that it cannot be corrupted or changed by anyone arbitrarily. It's just not possible, right? It's, it's individuals selecting which rules best serve their interest. And the consensus that comes from that selection is Bitcoin. So you can't, there's not, it's designed to be resistant to central authorities. And so you might think of uh, Bitcoin, it's almost like something that we say TikTok next block in Bitcoin, because you have blocks every 10 minutes. This is something that's so normal, so predictable, so unchangeable. Like it's almost as like the rising and setting sun. Like you can't do anything about it. You get into the situation that even if you're a central bank, even if you're a statist at heart and you believe we need to tyrannize and objectify everyone in the world, there comes a point where you just have to buy some of this thing just in case it succeeds, right? If, if I'm a central bank shareholder and I see Bitcoin continue to monetize, I need to make a fiduciary decision that I'm going to buy some of this asset to protect my business from being disrupted. Because if Bitcoin does succeed and central banking is disrupted and goes to zero, then at least I have some Bitcoin. And I haven't. I may have lost my business, but at least I've lost the asset that disrupted it. You see this a lot in software, right? Facebook, big dominant digital network for social media. Instagram comes on the scene, rapidly growing, right? Hugely popular social media application. What does Facebook do to protect itself against disruption from Instagram? It buys Instagram. So there's this natural motive for any institution, any organization that's threatened by Bitcoin to ultimately try to buy some of it to protect themselves from it. And again, beneath the surface of every organization are acting individuals that are just trying to preserve their own self-interest and, and outrun the inflation that's being forced upon them by central banks all over the world. One of my highest health priorities is keeping my brain in top shape. To take care of my brain power, I do many things such as striving to read, write, exercise, and meditate daily. One of the latest tools in my brain power toolkit is MindLab Pro. MindLab Pro is a nootropic supplement that is scientifically proven to enhance your brain power. When I take MindLab Pro, my mind feels like it has a better grip on the world, my thinking is more lucid, and the articulation of my speech is much more clear. MindLab Pro has been tested in rigorous, double-blind, placebo-controlled human trials and has been proven to enhance brain power for users in every age group. MindLab Pro is an advanced formulation of 11 nootropic ingredients and is backed by research from 1,473 human trials conducted over a period of 32 years. So if you're looking to start enhancing your brain power, MindLab Pro is an excellent solution. Go to mindlabpro.com slash breedlove to start enhancing your brain power today. Again, that's mindlabpro.com slash breedlove. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is a Bitcoin-enabled alternative to legacy health insurance. Now let's face it, legacy health insurance is an absolute scam. Nobody can explain this better than the legendary comedian, Chris Rock. This is insurance. You got to have some insurance. You got to, that's an insurance. They shouldn't even call it insurance. They should just call it in case shit. <laughs> like, I give a company some money in case shit happen. <laughs> now, if shit don't happen, shouldn't I get my money back? <laughs> <laughs> so with CrowdHealth, instead of just paying premiums that you'll never see again, you can hold part of this pool of savings in dollars and in Bitcoin through CrowdHealth. And when you have a health event, you can draw against this pool of communal savings. So go to joincrowdhealth.com slash breedlove to learn more or sign up. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Wasabi Wallet. With Wasabi Wallet, you can receive, send, and store Bitcoin privately. In Wasabi Wallet, your transaction history and wallet balance are completely hidden. Wasabi Wallet is easy to use. All of its privacy features are built in by default and it works with any amount of Bitcoin. Wasabi users can make CoinJoin transactions together with BTC Pay server users or Trezor Suite users. For BTC Pay server users, they can make payments directly inside of a CoinJoin, 
And for Trezor Suite users, you can make coin joins directly on a hardware wallet. These features result in the fee savings and security improvements for both sets of users. So go to wasabiwallet.io today to download the state-of-the-art Bitcoin privacy wallet. Yeah, if you look at the, the, the some of the problems in the world, and a lot of people say Bitcoin fixes this. Wars are created over mm -hmm. desire for gold or treasure, and Bitcoin would make that hard to do, the food system. Can you maybe talk about a little bit of that stuff, like how things are interrelated so that we can get a, a sense of the bigger picture? Yeah, there's a really good book on this written in 1997, I believe. Title of the book is The Sovereign Individual. And this is pre-Bitcoin that this book was written. But the thesis of this book was that there would come a point in the emergence of the internet that someone would figure out how to make an internet-based cash. They called it anonymous digital cyber cash. And that once this innovation occurred, and nation states would then no longer be able to have these arbitrary monetary policies where they just expand and contract the money supply at will to steal the savings from society, that people would naturally, as it, for all the reasons I've described today, start to migrate away from state money into anonymous digital cyber cash. And this would actually, this takes the state's ability to fund itself away largely. It reduces their revenues. So if you think of the state as a business, as a tax farm, effectively, right? It's there to just co collect the fruits of your labor and then to wage war and collect the fruits of other people's labor. People now have a way to opt out of that entire game and just hold a money that no one can change, no one can corrupt, no one can inflate, no one can steal. And so the thesis of that book is that we would actually by virtue of the invention of anonymous digital cyber cash, which today we call Bitcoin, we would see the dissolution of the nation state as the dominant institutional paradigm of the human race. And I think that explains a lot of the pain we're seeing. We're seeing centralized authorities and powers today shaken at their foundations by the emergence of the internet and by the emergence of Bitcoin. I think that's why you see all this doubling down on the psyops and the wokeism and the nonsense. like. There's that saying that it's darkest before the dawn, and for better or worse, we have to live through that period, right? We're living through a change of technological paradigm. Like, it's hard to overstate how big of a deal that is. If you could imagine talking to someone in the agricultural age and trying to describe to them all of the miracles and innovations of the industrial age, right? Oh, there are machines and there's buildings and there's glass and there's steel and there's automobiles and there's skyscrapers and there's jetliners and there's all these machines. The person in the agricultural age would not know what the fuck you were talking about. Like the words you're using would not register with them at all because it's not part of their reality. We are moving today from the industrial age into the digital age. And we see the changes that have already happened, right? They've been very rapid very extreme, but I think Bitcoin is an accelerant to that entire shift from the industrial age into the digital age. The folks that are still like the central banks, I guess you say they could either purchase it and control the asset or have a big position in the asset or they fight against it because people don't readily just give up power and position and wealth and privilege. They're going to fight against this. And so do we see some sort of ongoing conflict occurring? Does society have to collapse before people? You said pain drives us. Do we have to have hyperinflation in the U.S. where I can't afford to buy ground beef or something like that before this happens? Or what do you, how does this play out? Or do we know? Yeah, we, look, we don't know. Let's just, there's never been, it'd be like trying to sit here in 1994 and tell you what the internet's going to do. We can pontificate and theorize, but not many people in 1994 saw Amazon coming, Uber coming, Google, et cetera. Like you need the entrepreneurial experiment to play out to really see what's going to happen. I think the only real directional view you can get is by looking at the economics, right? Looking at the businesses themselves, who, which business sectors are going to suffer, which business sectors are going to succeed. And I think, I hope there's sort of two thoughts on this. 
Now, we could have this rather disturbing collapse of centralized powers, a move into chaos, and then possibly war, which obviously we're seeing the specter of that grow day by day. And then from the ashes, we rebuild society in a more, in a way that better honors individual sovereignty and honors um, our natural rights to life, liberty, and property. That's one view. But there's another view that has been called like the smooth transition, right? Where this uh, oppressiveness keeps getting pushed on people and people just start to migrate out, right? Like to trickle out a little bit at a time. Whoever's feeling the most pain or whoever's doing the most research, most homework to understand this thing, they just start to transition and migrate over to this new parallel system. So they're exiting the legacy financial system and moving into the Bitcoin financial system. And maybe you just shrink legacy finance and shrink the state slowly and grow the parallel system, grow the Bitcoin economy in tandem. So maybe there could just be this kind of smooth transition. And I don't know. I don't know what it's going to be like, but the long game I'm very optimistic for because, and again, this gets back to the sovereign individual which talks a lot about the economics and incentives of violence. Bitcoin is the most difficult to steal asset in history. If you custody this thing properly, it's basically impossible to steal. There's things called a multi-key solution or multi-signature solution where it's not just like you holding all your Bitcoin. You can distribute the key quorum amongst a few trusted individuals. And if you do it properly, Coercion doesn't even work. They can't put a gun to your head. Like you need, you have to execute certain protocols to move the Bitcoin. They might not know who those people are. They could be in different cities. So there's all these very sophisticated ways to custody and safeguard your assets. Now we're talking earlier about Germany, right? The big carrot on the end of the stick for the German blitzkrieg was the gold, right? We conquer Poland and we take their gold. We conquer this country, we take their gold. If you replay that on a Bitcoin standard, and these honeypots are now Bitcoin, the German army, there's not going to be anything to steal, right? So now you've disincentivized violence and warfare. There's less incentive to try to steal from people because it's more difficult to steal from people. So this, and this is a very deep topic. We talk about it for many hours on the show. And I think in the scope of that argument, Bitcoin can be perceived as one of the ultimate peacemaking technologies. It's like we finally have recourse to a form of private property that no one can just arbitrarily seize from us. And this is an ideal that's as old as the Magna Carta. The Magna Carta was signed by King John in 1215. The the exclusive scope of government was to preserve life, liberty, and give people inviolable private property. So to give people property that they know they can own and won't be stolen from them. And I think Bitcoin in many ways is the realization of that ideal. We finally have a form of property that is extremely difficult to steal, right? Like you might think you own your house or a piece of land or whatever, but when the guys with guns and boots come and say, this is ours, do you own it? You own it to the extent that you can defend it. Bitcoin is very easy to defend, very economically efficient to defend. So it maximally empowers the sovereignty and the freedom of the individual and maximally disempowers the threat of the state or the collective. Yeah. How important is it? You talk about proper custody of it. I've heard the term no keys, no coin or something like that. If you have your Bitcoin on, on say an exchange and some of them had big problems is, are the exchanges going to be viable? Cause a lot of people are used to using a bank and a credit card and it's, I guess it's a new, I guess a new paradigm you have to get used to, but how is there going to play in part of this future? Do we have exchanges still or or does everybody have their hard wallet? their are cold card wallets and things like that. How does that work? Again, hard to say, but my view would be that, as you said, we say in Bitcoin, not your keys, not your coin. So if you're not holding the actual private key to the Bitcoin, either yourself or in a circle of trust, like I said, with a multi-key setup, then you don't have Bitcoin. You have an IOU from someone, an exchange or a bank or whoever, that says they owe you Bitcoin. They may or may not make good on that promise. This is what we call counterparty risk. 
My view is that the market would naturally move away from counterparty risk as much as possible. So maybe you see banks engaging in collaborative custody, like this bank holds one part of the private key, this bank holds another, you hold part of it, your accountant holds part of it, your attorney holds another part of it, you need three of five to move funds, right? You're distributing the trust among multiple people such that no one counterparty can defraud you, basically. I think that's the way the market would move over time, but we're very early in this game. Right now, we have traditional banks that provide Bitcoin services, both in terms of buy, sell, and custody. You mentioned exchanges, a lot of exchanges. My general warning to people would be though, if you, not your keys, not your coin. If you don't hold the private key, you don't have Bitcoin. Like that cannot be repeated loudly or often enough because people often think, hey, I have all this Bitcoin on Mt. Gox or Quadriga or any of these other exchanges that have collapsed. And then they wake up one day and it's poof, gone. So you don't own Bitcoin unless you self-custody the private key to that Bitcoin. Yeah, I think that's fair enough. I guess if you, like I said, if you had gold in the bank and they decided not to give it to you. I mean, I guess I see people now, even with U.S. dollars, you go to withdraw a sizable amount of money and they're like, what are you using it for? You know, well, yeah, maybe exactly. maybe you can't have all of it right now. So that's already a kind of a concerning signal uh, yeah. that that's that. What else? Food. <laughs> Let's talk just briefly about food. We talk about fiat food, and I know Safe has talked about that. And I've seen there's a book now called Fiat Food. I, I, I interviewed a guy, Matt Lashayk, I think that that wrote that, and it's similar. I think Safe wrote the forward on that. Talk about the relationship between beef and Bitcoin, if you don't, if you don't mind spending just a minute on that. <laughs> So I'm largely inspired by you and others in the carnivore community. I discovered the carnivore community through Bitcoin, actually. And I, for years, I had suffered from like gut inflammation. I don't know, like leaky gut. I'm not, never really got it fully diagnosed what I had going on, but did a lot of experimentation and ultimately found carnivore diet made me feel way, way better. Right. I had skin issues, uh, joint issues. I had like quick muscle fatigue, the list goes on and on. But when I would get, it was initially, initially a keto diet, I felt better. But then when I went full carnivore, I felt a lot better. Today, I'm not full carnivore. I don't know what, I don't know where you draw the line. I eat cheese. I eat a little bit of fruit. I eat a lot of beef. I probably get 80 or 90% of my calories from beef or red meat. I do some raw dairy. I do raw milk, raw yogurt, raw cheese, as I said. It's what is the connection here? I guess you could say in the same way that a carnivore diet is like a form of ancient wisdom, perhaps, right? It's what humans have been doing for millions of years, right? We've lived on this type of diet for millions of years. Sound money or hard money or money you can't counterfeit gold, right? Gold has been money for 5,000 years. That's ancient economic wisdom, right? We know that works, yet the systems that we're living inside can't adhere to it. There's also this thought I've had about just like energy density. So like beef, clearly one of its big advantages is that it has probably, I guess, the best nutrient density of almost any food, or at least near the top. I don't know, maybe oysters or something is a little bit higher. And to analogize that to Bitcoin, it's like Bitcoin is economically dense or purchasing power dense, right? You can store any amount of purchasing power in Bitcoin and it can't, it doesn't break down. It doesn't decay. So there's this energy density principle that maybe beef and (laughs) Bitcoin share. And then for the rest, I think you get into these weird, when you have a government monopoly on money, they start to subsidize industries like the sugar industry or corn or whatever. So when you say subsidize, let's be specific, governments are stealing from people, taxation and inflation, and then they decide, hey, let's use some of these stolen proceeds to fund certain things, agriculture, whatever it may be, that we deem socially useful or socially good. And so you start to subsidize corn or sugar or whatever it may be. What happens? You get more people eating corn and sugar and other bullshit foods. And then with that comes all the metabolic sickness and you get the sad, what do they call the standard American diet? Sad, right? 
And so when I look at the United States and I'm walking around in most cities in the U.S., I see a lot of sad people because they're eating a sad diet. And so maybe if we take away the government's monopoly on currency production, again, we're reducing their revenues, we're reducing their ability to subsidize these shit food industries, then maybe people start to get healthier as a pro- as a result. Yeah. And, and I see a lot of now ranchers. I know there's a beef initiative. I got in Texas Slim. I don't know if you're familiar with some of his stuff, but they, they're starting this little mini economy with Bitcoin being able to purchase beef. What? Let me ask you, because I I have, I, all I do is hold it. I got it. And I just, just dollar cost average. And that's all I do at this moment. I don't think about it, but maybe later I'll, I'll get to a point where I can actually maybe spend it. But what can you buy with Bitcoin today? There's lots of websites you can check out. If you want to spend Bitcoin directly, there's different businesses that you can buy things with. I actually don't know a lot about it because I do what you do. I buy Bitcoin every day. I stack it and I aim to never sell it basically. And but you could also say Bitcoin is 24 by 7 liquid against the US dollar and all fiat currencies. So anything that any of those currencies can buy, your Bitcoin can buy. You're just one extra hop away. But I don't recommend spending Bitcoin at this stage in Bitcoin's monetization because, again, it's 0.5% of global cash balances. We're printing money at an unprecedented rate globally. Obviously, governments are taxing more and inflating more. That all lends itself to a rapid appreciation of Bitcoin. And if you look at Bitcoin's price history, typically 10 days out of every year define the year of of its price action. So if you're out of the market for even one or two of those days, you might miss out on all of the gains, basically. So the strategy you're running is the strategy I run. It's the strategy I recommend. Obviously, do your own research, whatever suits your own financial needs. I can't be prescriptive, but I think that's the easiest way to do it. You don't even have to think about it, right? You set up a recurring buy. There's services that will not only allow you to do a recurring purchase of Bitcoin, but also a recurring withdrawal into self-custody. And so I just set it and forget it. And so I'm just accumulating Bitcoin all the time. I keep myself profitable and it's freed up. So I have gained so much freedom as a result. Someone that used to run a hedge fund and trade stocks and all of this, like it's a lot of noise in your brain trying to keep up with all these things and turn a profit here and there and you're studying, blah, blah, blah. It's like all that has just been cleared out. And I just get to do what I want to do every day. And I've outperformed basically every other investment in the world over the past seven years. And it is quite simply that, right? Just buy it every day, save it and stay profitable. Yeah. So future, eat a bunch of self custody, your your Bitcoin, eat a bunch of beef and stay happy, stay, stay, stay safe. Robert, this has been fascinating. Thank you so much. I I'm glad I finally got to chat with you. Any last minute words before we go? No, you can check me out on whatismoneypodcast.com. We're like almost episode 400. We go all the way down the Bitcoin rabbit hole. It's study Bitcoin or study the nature of money. These are my biggest pieces of advice to people today. I think it just helps you see through the bullshit, helps you unplug from the matrix. So that is my biggest piece of advice. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Have a, have a wonderful time in Antwerp and I'm hopefully I get to talk you down, talk to you again down the road. All right. Thank you, Sean. Thanks everybody. You guys have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye now. <laughs>